know how sometimes in life things can really get you down? You know, and you see things in the world, in the newspaper, and, and on the news, and you just say to yourself, you know, this, this is so terrible. I just want to just throw in the towel and give up. Well, I want you to know the fact that my wife and I uh, will be moving uh, next month permanently to Costa Rica. In no way should you get discouraged and... No, I'm just teasing. That was a joke. <laughs> uh, so, no, we're not moving to Costa Rica. It's, have you been to Costa Rica before? Anyone here? Go. It's, it's really... It, it, it's something... They, 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 you know, they have these nice postcards with the, the beach and the ocean and the palm tree, you know, curved out. But it's something they don't show you on the postcard is how hot and sticky it is. They just don't show you that. Uh, I used to live in Texas. I just came back actually from Dallas not that long ago, and it was like, they had a, a couple tornadoes moving through. Uh, I mean, it's just different world, different world. And uh, while I was there, I, I, I realized why Texans are so serious about their, their faith. Uh, because uh, in, their, in, time, in the spring, they're, they're, they see these funnel clouds, and they're re, you know, reminded they could be sucked up at any moment. And then in the summertime, they're reminded where they go if they don't go to heaven. Okay. <laughs> So I'm just, that's my little two cents. All right. Uh, but it, it's, uh, it's what, what, you know, it's really easy though in life uh, to become complacent. And, uh, and what happens in life when everything is finally smooth and you're finally on cruise control and everything is going great, right? What happens? Suddenly a big cow gets in the middle of the road and you have to go left or right or have lots of hamburger meat. And... You know, that line works much better in Texas. But, uh, anyways, but that's what happened to me. Uh, I was, uh, at the time, I'd opened an office five years prior to, for the Rutherford Institute back, in, back east, and I was coordinating litigation in 14 western states, defending religious freedom, parents' rights, and sanctity of human life. And uh, everything was going really smooth. Really, everything. Built up the attorney network. It was going great. And then I get a call from the national office telling me that they're going to shut down the regional offices. They have to scale back for financial reasons. But not to worry, they want to promote me to be the head of their public affairs office in Washington, D.C. I'd be handling all the media. I'd represent, I'd be the face of the organization, including testifying before Congress. Have a, a higher salary, larger staff, larger office, right there in the nation's capital. So, of course, I don't have to pray about this. God's obviously closing one door and opening another one. So I said, yes. And then I had insomnia. And then I had more insomnia and more insomnia. Finally, I went, oh, shoot, I have to pray about this. Now, why was that my attitude? I'll tell you why. Because I don't know about you, but whenever I get this fork in the road and there's the easy way with a lollipop at the end, and then there's the, the hard way, jaggedy and requiring that thing called faith, how, how are you usually convicted? I, I'm convicted almost always to have to do the hard way requiring faith. And so this was no exception. I prayed about it, and I felt convicted that God wanted me to... And so, with boldness and courage, I said, Yes, Lord, I will rise to the call. I will rise to the challenge. I will boldly, on several conditions. Um, and this is just what happened, too. I was... I said, I've got to make sure God's behind this. So I said, I'll do this, but I've got to make sure behind this. Free office space, definitely donated in Sacramento, free. Free computer system. Keep me on the two radio stations for free. Uh, we have to be in the black in just three months, and I'm never going to charge anyone at any time for any legal representation. I thought it was very reasonable with my, my business model. Um, and God came through on all of it, and it was miraculous. Uh, even the office space. I didn't tell anyone I was looking for free office space. You know why? I told God. And if I don't get it, boom, I'm off the hook. I told God. It, I had an attitude issue, okay? You know that guy Jonah in the Bible got swallowed up with a with whale and all? He had an attitude. I can really connect with that guy. Uh, so, but I, uh, so I was just had this attitude issue. Well, I get this call out of the blue. We're in the last month shutting down the, the office for Rutherford. And I pick up the phone. And he says, yeah, um, you don't know me, but I, uh, I have free office space for you. I heard you, need, I heard you need free office space. I have free office space for you. And instead of saying, oh, thank you, Jesus. Oh, this is such an... No, I said, how'd you know I needed office space? 
And it was so abrupt that my secretary comes in and says, can, can, put him on hold, put him on hold. Can, can I put you on hold? Okay, yeah, great, yeah. What, Pamela? She goes, um, yeah, you don't know this, but before I knew they were shutting down our office, um, two months ago, I, you know, I knew that our lease was going to be expiring and you always want to save money for the ministry. So I called KYCC Radio, asked them to put in a free public service announcement saying we needed free office space. <laughs> and I'm just looking at her going, that was not you. But I said, yes, we need office space. And God took care of it. And it was really great because the whole process uh, of starting the ministry of Pacific Justice was one where the Lord was teaching me, Brad, this is not Brad's ministry. Serving the Lord Jesus Christ. No, 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 no. This is God's ministry. And by his grace and mercy, he presently has Brad Dacus participating at this time. And there's so much freedom that comes in Christ when we realize it's not about us. It's not about who we are. It's about whose we are. And the, the strength and the courage that we have when we realize it's about him and what he wants to do. And, uh, and the, the freedom that we have in Christ when we don't limit God by limiting ourselves and understanding it's his baby, not ours. So that's a little bit of my story. Uh, fast forward. We now have not just an office in Sacramento. We now have... Um, offices in almost 30 states, coast to coast. Six offices just here in California alone. We have, uh, you know, in, in Boston and three in New York and Miami, Atlanta, Maryland, Trent, New Jersey, Philadelphia, Chicago, uh, Detroit. I just came back from Detroit uh, yesterday, late yesterday. And, uh, and then many other places as well, uh, working hard to, uh, to defend uh, religious freedom, parents' rights, and the sanctity of human life. Uh, we have a lot of challenges that we're, we're facing as a nation. Um, and yet, uh, amidst those challenges, uh, are great opportunities. Now, it is easy to get discouraged. And so I want to take us to one of the most depressing parts of Scripture. Um, <laughs> it has a happy ending. Um, and that is in the book of Esther. In the book of Esther. Uh, so you choose, uh, go to Esther chapter 4, um, Esther chapter 4, verse 1. Oh, you know what? You don't need to turn there. Just trust me. I'm a lawyer. <laughs> I know. I know there's a lot of jokes about lawyers, but I just want to set the record straight. Flipped faster to the scriptures. But... <laughs> so that was good. Okay, so let me give you a little backdrop here. Uh, we're talking about the Median Persian Empire, and they took over Babylon, the Babylonian Empire. And it stretched from like Ethiopia to India. It was huge, right? Uh, the, the number of, of Jews living there, huge number of Jews living there, uh, as far as uh, people of, of, uh, of the Jewish heritage and religion. And... Um, there was a gentleman, Mordecai, and he's Jewish, and he had this cousin, Esther, and Esther's parents died, so he took Esther under his wing. He was older, so he was like a father to, to Esther, to, to care for her, to raise her uh, properly in the faith, and uh, then a, a big challenge happened and took place. Now, I'm going to stop right here and just do a quick pinpoint that point, because we're going to come back to it, a quick reference to Father's Day. So, because when you hear these stories like Mordecai, you're like, yeah, way to go. He was a good father figure. And the deceiver, Satan, likes to tell dads that um, one of yours didn't turn out so well. Maybe all of them didn't turn out so well. Uh, and it's easy to let the great accuser to get you down. It's easy to get discouraged when you, you, you raise your children in the way they should go and they're not following the Lord. And statistically, uh, a lot of young people are leaving the faith, particularly when they go to colleges and universities. Um, public schools, I call them spiritual death camps. Uh, I wish we had more Christians boldly in, in the public schools uh, because of the spiritual warfare. And it's real easy to get discouraged. And I want you to know, this is something that I had to go through, or I'm going through. Um, one of my kids uh, is, a, is a prodigal right now, rebelling. 
And the accuser was just attacking me, saying, if you had been a better dad, if you had... It's the great accuser, that's his nickname, and the great deceiver. So uh, I was getting really depressed. And uh, fortunately, I was meeting with some pastors in an event happening in Kansas City. And one of the pastors, he said, a number of pastors, he said, oh, yeah, yeah, my, my son's rebelling. Oh, my daughter, she rebelled till she was 50 and et cetera. And then one of the pastors said, Brad, do you think God's a good father? I said, well, yeah, God's a perfect father. And he said, you know, his first two didn't turn out so well. And it's because of free will. And so don't allow the great deceiver. Yeah, no one's a perfect dad, but don't allow the great deceiver to pull you down. Right? They have a free will. And um, the verse does say, you know, when we're talking about the promise of the future, you know, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart. The word does not return void. It's still there. And God is still moving and still working, just oftentimes not on our timetable. Um, also, it's real easy to get into uh, what I call worry prayers. So you think to yourself, okay, i got to pray really hard, really, really hard. And I just got to pray and just tell God how just, oh, I'm painful and desperate. And I just, uh, you know, if you had whips, you'd be do, doing that at the same time, you know. But uh, and I call those worry prayers. And I was doing a lot of worry prayers. And I was driving to church, of all places, and I'm about to make a left-hand turn on this particular street. I, it's, it's clear as crystal. I'm engaging in one of my worry prayers. And the Lord, Holy Spirit, interrupts my thinking with, do you think you love me more than I do? And it was the Lord, clearly, because it was not, my thinking, it was not my, my thinking pattern. And it was in the first person. Do you think you love me more than I do? And God doesn't do this every day to me. It's just, it's just when I'm pig-headed in the wrong direction, that's when I get interrupted by the Holy Spirit, it seems like. But uh, and I said, no, Lord, you love me much more than I do. And the next thing that hit me was, trust me. And I was not trusting the Lord. Philippians chapter 4, be anxious for what? Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, through prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's, has, that's what God, how God wants us to pray. And if we have worry and fret while we're praying and after we pray, that means we're not praying right. Because... When we pray right, we have the peace that passes understanding from the Lord. And we need to pray with thanksgiving of believing that God's hearing our prayer and that he's doing something and that he is a, a great, powerful, loving God. That we can put our hope and trust in him. So hopefully I hurt, hit some, some notes here this morning. I know at Father's Day how Satan has used that before with me. So if some of you are out there going like cringing when you see Father's Day up there, like, uh, you know, um, hopefully that's a little bit of encouragement. Okay, let's go back to the word. All right, so Mordecai's uh, brought up Esther. She's Jewish also, of course. And uh, she becomes queen, um, which is fantastic. But no one knows that she's Jewish. She hasn't revealed that to anyone. And also at this point, Hammond, uh, who is one of the, the higher-ups uh, under the king, um, Caesar, he, he has decided that he does not like Mordecai. Mordecai... Uh, is someone who puts God over the king, and he decides he wants to kill Mordecai, but not just him, but all the Jews. So he does this, this flattery appeal to the king to issue an order with an official seal that cannot be broken, ordering and allowing all the Jews to be killed on the days of March the 7th and March 8th. So that becomes law. Mordecai hears about this. All the Jews are going to be killed. Authorization by the king. And here's where we are in chapter 4, verse 1. Now, I would start to say this is really bad, right? This is really, really bad. We're talking about the entire wiping out of most of the Jewish people uh, by far. Almost a huge, huge proportion of them. Verse 1. When Mordecai learned all that had happened, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and, and ashes and went out into the midst of a city. He cried out with a loud and bitter cry. So 
Number one, Mordecai was not in denial. Sometimes we see things happening on TV because I'm not going to watch the news anymore. Um, I'm just, just blah, 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 blah. I'm just going to you know, sing some Christian music and, you know, and uh, just be oblivious. No. Um, God doesn't want us to be, have our heads in the sand. Um, we as Christians, we're big boys and girls in the, in the faith. We can deal with whatever the challenges are that are facing us, our family, our nation, etc. cetera. Um, and we need to be praying about it. We need to be addressing it. Uh, and not downplaying it, but understand where we are for such a time as this. Understand where we are, uh, and that's, that's so important. Now, where are we in the United States today, for example? Let me give some examples. Uh, we used to, we've defended churches on land use zoning issues, and then the unthinkable happened. The government shut down the churches and opened everything else up. You remember that? And the red states, the freedom-loving states, they opened the churches up with, you know, uh, restaurants and everything. But California says, no, open the restaurants, open the strip clubs, open the pot shops, keep those churches closed. And it was not an accident, I believe, that we had some of the greatest rioting and massive chaos in history when the churches were shut down during that period of time. Well, um, we at Pacific Justice took on the case, and we filed a lawsuit and we got an emergency writ granted by the United States Supreme Court. And in just three days, and great things happen in three days. Easter, okay, okay, for those of you who are still wondering. <laughs> in just three days, the Supreme Court, in a 6-3 to three vote, ordered Governor Gavin Newsom, open those churches now. And he did, and it sent shockwaves across America. <clears throat> then we had a major purging. Not incidental. I mean massive purging purging of Christians from their jobs, not because they weren't doing a good job, but because of their sincere faith and convictions regarding a very serious and controversial vaccine. You know what I'm talking about. And anyone who's had that vaccine, I'm just teasing. Um, some people got the vax. Some, of them, some people in my office, they got the vax. And other people didn't get the vax. I was praying and studying and re seeking God and looking at different brands. And then finally, God just says, I'll take care of it for you. Here, here's COVID, you know. So I didn't have to worry about it too much longer. Um, but so the issue is not who got it and who didn't get it. The issue is one of freedom and the ability for a free society for us to be able to live our faith and not be purged massively from the workplace because of our sincerely held religious beliefs. That's why we have Title VII to require employers to reasonably accommodate sincerely held religious beliefs absent an undue burden or a substantial cost not to. So we took on these cases on a massive scale. We led the nation on, on, the, on the cases from early on from the get-go. And uh, other organizations wouldn't even touch it. And I told them, I said, send them all to us. And they did. And by God's grace, we were able to help a lot of people, a lot of people. Um, and then we had another big tsunami hit us called pronouns. Whoever thought pronouns would be a, a topic of controversy? No more than vowels or synonyms or, you know. Oh, well, a little joke there, right? So pronouns uh, have hit our country where teachers were being told they had to lie to parents. They had to use pronouns to affirm uh, confusion in a child regarding their gender. It's so cruel. Uh, what teacher with any kind of a conscience, with any kind of love for children, would knowingly and willingly encourage confusion. Much less confusion that we now know, released just a couple weeks ago, a study that shows results in a suicide rate that's not 100% more, no, that is 1,200% more, 12 times greater than the average kid. It's horrific. Well, we at Pacific Justice, we don't get angry. We just sue. So, no. Um, <laughs> Nine out of ten of our cases we get resolved without litigation, and right now we have, but we do have 265 cases in litigation coast to coast. Uh, and this is one of our cases against the Attorney General of New Jersey. Why? Because the Attorney General says, I'm ordering every single public school teacher to lie to parents, and not only to lie to parents, uh, but also use a pronoun even if it violates their conscience. So we're suing the Attorney General of New Jersey um, through our office in Trenton, New Jersey. 
and taking them on full head of the de dead center. We're also, yeah, we're also in our office in Detroit dealing with, because uh, our attorney there also went to med school. Just, it's so nice. Uh, and uh, yeah, he's a real brain. Uh, he, he went, uh, he's, he's taking on medical death row cases. What's medical death row? Well, I, I came up with that term. So if you haven't heard before, that's why. It's uh, people who are critically in need of an organ transplant to live. They make it to the top of the list, but in 7% of all the hospitals, if you're not vaxxed, you don't get to live with the COVID vax. Now, 93%, they don't care. Um, they don't, you don't have to be vaxxed with the COVID vax to get your heart or your lungs that you need to live. But 7%, they say yes. By the way, all of those, it turns out that um, they're big guys uh, and they're ones that have contracts with big pharma. Just a coincidence, maybe, I don't know. But at any rate, we are, uh, we've been taking those on and we've now helped uh, more than two dozen people live and get the transplant that they need, uh, including against a, yeah, so. Um, and then we have Child Protective Services. They're now taking children from parents, not because the parents are abusive, but because the parents refuse to affirm and encourage gender confusion in their children when they have, when the child expresses some kind of confusion, which is not actually that uncommon to varying degrees, especially in early adolescence. And that's, when, that's where Satan is going after him. And we have public schools and a lot of teachers who have be, are into that. It's, it's so discouraging to see that happen. On my flight uh, last night, late last night from Detroit, a lady was right in front of us. Uh, I sort of had this feeling when she was getting on, like, I don't know, I just had this negative, not negative, that's not a good word to say, but cautious feeling that makes it a little better. Um, okay, negative. Anyway, so she sits in front of us, and I start listening to what she says, and usually I'm the loud talker, but I'm listening to her, and um, she's talking to someone else in the seat, seats in front of us, and she says, talking about her niece, and she goes, yeah, my, my niece, yeah, she's, she has a, you know, she needs to be, gender, has, needs gender-affirming care, and her parents don't know it, but I'm working with the niece behind the scenes to help her to... To, to her desire to, to, to be a boy instead of a girl. And I'm just hearing this. And, you know, my wife was looking at me like, don't, don't make a commotion. <laughs> so I, I, just, I just started praying and, uh, for God to work. But it's just, it was just a clear reminder how real this is and how vast and massive this darkness has hit our country in ways that only you, you think of before only from a sci-fi movie of the end times, perhaps. But it's not a sci-fi movie. It's, it is now, and we are here for such a time as this. Um, and then in Idaho, we have an interesting case there dealing with a, a bus driver who uh, did an op-ed piece about what was in the school library after the principal and superintendent wouldn't do anything. He did this op-ed piece, and then he was fired because they said, no, you said something negative about the school district, so you're fired. Well, that may be fine for communist China, where in order to work for the government, you have to say, oh, all hail the government, all hail the rulers. But this not, that's not the United States, United States. We don't lose our First Amendment rights um, just because we work for the government. We keep those rights. And we at PJI believe in that. And so we filed a lawsuit in that case. Um, and then we have a, another case dealing with another bus driver who went to a, a rally for a boy who was denied his graduation certificate because he simply said, I believe that guys are guys, girls are girls, and there's nothing else in between. And because of that, he wasn't given his graduation certificate. And he went to, they had a rally, he went to a rally. The bus driver on his own time went to the rally. Someone from the school district saw the bus driver, fired him, simply for attending his own rally on his, the rally on his own time. And so we filed a lawsuit, and I can't give you the dollar amount, but it was a nice settlement. So... And then we've recently been going to bat for a lot of Jewish students uh, because I've seen them. It's outrageous. It is demonic, and I believe, once again, it's a sign of the times. That which was unthinkable, which is massive number of students. And they're not all from Muslim students from the Middle East, 
A lot of these are students who are just brought into this stuff, and a lot of professors are behind it. Over 100 at Columbia University signed a letter of support, effectively support for Hamas. Um, and these kids are all being indoctrinated and bombarded spiritually. Uh, and it is spiritual because blessed are those who bless Israel, cursed are those who curse Israel. And it's very serious. So we came forward and we pledged to defend every single Jewish student in the universities and in public schools being harassed or attacked because of their, Jew their Jewish faith. And uh, we've already got some cases already uh, uh, in the works. Um, and one of them's in a public high school. So there's a lot of challenges taking place uh, for such a time as this. And what should be uh, our perspective? Let's go back to the, 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 uh, the trials of what's taking place in Esther chapter 4. Let's see, let's see how they dealt with it because there's some great teaching here. So verse 3, it says, And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning. Uh, oh, actually, verse 2. I, don't think I, I think I skipped verse 2. He went as far from... To, oh, yeah, no, I already did that one. Okay, verse 3. <laughs> All right. See, you're just paying attention. This is good. All right. And in verse 3, uh, And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was great mourning among the Jews, with fasting, weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. The people got it. They weren't in denial where they were. They knew what was at stake. And they dealt with it head on. We as believers need to have the same attitude as we deal with the challenges facing our nation. One of those ways, um, to be frank, is to register to vote and to vote. Uh, it's, it's very basic. Some people say, well, God raises up and he brings down. And that's very true. We have no reason to worry about election or outcomes. In fact, after elections, I go to the book of Revelations and I flip through it, especially if it's outcomes I didn't like. And I go, okay, let's see. Yep, yep, yep. It's still there. Every word is still in the book of Revelations. Nothing's changed. God didn't lose any sleep over this. Why should I? So why should we vote? There's many reasons given for it. Um, but one of them I think is really important is it's about our testimony. If God raises up and brings down, it's not about results, but it's about our testimony. Because when a church is, is filled with the love of Jesus, then it means they care about people outside their church walls. Their faith is real. Their love for Christ is real. And if you care about people outside the church walls, whether it's the pre-born or others, you're going to vote. It's a manifestation of the fact that you have a love that is from God and is above just your own complacency. And don't worry, if you don't think it matters, secular society and those that look at the statistics of who votes and who doesn't, it does matter, and they're watching. And so we want to make sure we are faithful to understand the times we're in and to respond accordingly, uh, both in prayer as well as with the actions that God's given us. Verse 4, so Esther's maids and eunuchs came and told her, and the queen was deeply distressed. Then she sent garments to clothe uh, Mordecai and take his cloth, sackcloth from, away from him, uh, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called Hathnach, uh, uh, one of the king's eunuchs, whom he had appointed to attend her, and she gave him a command concerning Mordecai to learn what and why this was. Verse 6. So Hathnach went out to Mordecai in the city square, uh, that was in the front of the king's gate. Verse 7, And Mordecai told him all that had happened to him and the sum of money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries to destroy the Jews. Verse 8, He also gave him a copy of the written decree for, the, for their destruction, which was given at Sheshan, that he might show it to Esther and explain it to her, that he might command her to go into the king to make supplication to him and plead before him for her people. Now, what's interesting here is Mordecai wasn't expecting the Esther to rely on some rumor. He provided the goods. He provided the facts and the information. Sometimes Christians, I've seen them quickly jump into one conspiracy thing or another, or I heard from so-and-so. And even now with the Internet, so much of it you can't even trust. I think we need to be more critical than ever to make sure that things are validated, right, as we look at these things. But when we realize what's true, um, we need to also then be responsible. 
Verse 10, then Esther spoke to Hathak and gave him a command. Wait a minute. Oh, that's right. Okay, good. Um, so Hathak returned and told Esther the words of Mordecai. Then Esther spoke to Hathak and gave him a command for Mordecai. Verse 11, all the king's servants, so this is Esther talking, all the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court of the, to the king who has not been called, he has but one law, put all to death except uh, it's into, uh, into the king these 30 days. Verse 12, so they told Mordecai Esther's words. So who's Esther thinking of right here? She's thinking about Esther, right? Isn't that how easy it is sometimes for us when we look at things going on? It's like, oh, here's a challenge. Okay, how do I protect myself? Okay, I'm going to get the, the, uh, the, the, the dried food. Uh, I'm going to get the water. Food. We're going to get the, the, uh, the, the solar-powered heater. We will be just fine, okay? <laughs> now, it's okay. I'm a, I'm a mini prepper, okay? I've got some of that stuff I just talked about, by the way, okay? But if that's where we stop, when we look at the challenges facing today, we've missed it. We need to instead be like what? Like Mordecai, who not, didn't just think himself, but, but saw the big picture and understood it and responded fully, robustly, calling upon the Lord, not even privately, but also not to be ashamed to do it publicly so that people and, and those in authority might be influenced. Um, so how did, uh, how did Mordecai respond to this selfish response seemingly by Esther? And Mordecai told them to answer Esther, quote, Do not think in your heart, and she said heart, it's a heart issue, isn't it? Right? That you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, Relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. Top right there. Uh, how easy it is for us to think that God needs us, right? Especially when you're in ministry. Well, I'm so glad that I'm here to help God out. Really? God can make the rocks and the trees do his work. That's the kind of God we have. God gives us the privilege to be glorified through our lives by the grace and mercy of what Jesus Christ did on the cross, not because of us. It's a privilege to respond to the opportunity for God to work in our lives wherever he has put us in whatever capacity it may be. Um, so let's continue on here. Um, so we revise what I just say. All right, where was I at here? Okay, uh, all right. Uh, verse 14, I'll just go back to verse 14. Oh, right, 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 verse 12, 13. Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. So face the reality, Esther. If not for the sake of others, face the reality. In the long run, it doesn't pay to be Focused on yourself. Um, God doesn't bless that. You'll perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. How awesome it is to recognize the sovereign hand of God. Uh, many times they say, well, I'm just doing this. Or I'm just over here. Really? Spiritually, that's a, whole, that's a whole opportunity that God has given you to be a salt and light to where you are, maybe in school, maybe in the workplace, uh, maybe at a retirement home, um, whatever, God has given you that opportunity, and it is always for such a time as this, for the time that he created you to be and the place you are. Verse 15, then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai. So now we're going to see a little change in her attitude. Verse 16, go, gather all the Jews who are present in Sheshen and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink for three days, night or day. Okay, so she's, she understands. Her, she's, her life's on the line. She could be killed. So I want everyone to fast. Neither eat or drink for three day, uh, night or days uh, for three days. My maids and I will fast likewise. So I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. 
So Mordecai went his way and did according to all that Esther commanded him. Um, she came to grips with reality, and she knew what she needed to do. Um, and sometimes that's us, isn't it? It's instinctive to think of ourselves. That's easy. Um, but, it's, but it's also empowering when God breaks us from that and lets us see something beyond ourselves uh, for such a time as this. For such a time as this. Now, um, we could stop right here, and, and I'll just tell you that all the Jews did die, and she, no, no, it's not what happened. Um, it actually has a happy ending. Uh, but when you look at the story, you may say to yourself, why, why didn't God just strike Haman dead to begin with? There wouldn't have been the king's order. Jews didn't have to worry about anything, right? And oftentimes, that's what it looks like. We just see nothing but with no light at the end of the tunnel. What happened with the king's order to kill the Jews was the best thing that could have happened. Why? Let's take a look at uh, chapter 8. Chapter 8. Now, someone could take the AI and take that little clip and just hurt me so much. So, oh well. Because here's the rest of the story. Verse, uh, chapter 8, uh, verse 17. The very end. So what happens is, fast forward, uh, Hammond uh, is exposed. He's uh, killed, hung on the thing that he built, the big uh, stake that he built to, to kill Mordecai with. Mordecai is promoted. Uh, God gives Mordecai and the people of Israel the authority to defend themselves and to have great victory throughout the Median Persian Empire. And we see the fruit of it in verse 17. And in every province and city, wherever the king's command and decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a holiday. Then many of the people of the land became Jews because of fe the fear of the Jews fell upon them. Whoa! This was the best thing that could have happened was for Haman to do what he did because it opened the door, number one, for the people of Israel to see the deliverance of their God to see his favor, to see his power. And many became Jews. They began to follow the Lord God, Jehovah, instead of the pagan gods. This was awesome. Best thing that could have happened was the pronouncement of death upon all the Jews in, Mordecai, uh, in the Median Persian Empire. Now, our, Satan works, I believe, with a chess, a chess board. He's bound by time and space. God is beyond the dimensions of time and space. God, I believe, works more like with a three-dimensional chess, uh, chess game instead of uh, something elementary, like checkers. So when we look at things like from a checkerboard, checkerboard, we think, oh, this is terrible. How can anything good from it? And yet our God is so complex, we need to walk in faith, realizing with our eyes opened up of what God may be doing, or even more importantly, how he may want to use us to make a difference. Uh, sometimes in the news, just recently, I've looked at things and I've just shaken my head. I just went, oh, this is terrible. This is awful. And then I remind myself, ah, God is a three-dimensional chess player. And what Satan may use for evil and, and try to implement for evil, God can use for good many times over. And that's the kind of Lord God and Savior that we have. Um, I want you to know that we see a lot of positive things happening amidst the challenges we're facing because of the three Supreme Court justices appointed between 2016 and 2020, um, we've had incredible victories we've seen in the Supreme Court. For religious freedom of employees, incredible victories shoring up the protection of employees because of their faith, requiring a higher standard of undue burden to justify not accommodating them. Employers, business owners, are protected as persons pursuant to the free exercise clause to live their faith by the Supreme Court. Parents have a right, and it's constitutional for, for school choice. We've seen that. We're going to see other parents' right litigation move forward. And then, um, and then we also see, of course, the reversal of Roe versus Wade, opening the door, the floodgate, for states to pass great laws protecting the preborn from being murdered. Um, these are great opportunities in moving forward. We have Pacific Justice and our, our legislative division we worked to get six states to pass laws, six that said boys can't go into girls' locker rooms and they can't compete in girls' sports, which was a great victory. 
Um, uh, I also, I personally testified in Texas, we spearheaded legislation that now it's legal for every school district to have a paid chaplain for every school in the state of Texas that wants it. Um, Louisiana, we led the charge there for uh, the Ten Commandments to be posted in every school classroom in the state of Louisiana. I mean, uh, the fact is there's, there's so much positive, so many good things that we're seeing accomplished, and I'm very, very optimistic uh, for what I hope we'll see uh, be able to be accomplished, not just this year, but also potentially in 2025, 2026. So uh, we have a lot of challenges facing us, but we have a, an awesome God. Uh, but you know the most important challenge that we have is personal, and that is whether or not we have that personal relationship with the Lord, whether or not we are going to go to heaven. Um, oftentimes, people can be very religious. They can be people that decide to, you know, go to church, uh, maybe become a deacon, an usher, maybe someone who's gone to confirmation, uh, gone through uh, confession many times, have gone through church camp, go Indian Village, yay, okay. Um, okay, I just revealed my age there. So, but there's, there's so many things we can do, but the question is, do you have a real personal relationship with the Lord? And more importantly, have you put your trust completely in Jesus, what he did on the cross? In 2 Timothy chapter 4, Paul is about to die, and he knows he's about to die. In verse 8, this is what he says. He says, finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. Time out, Paul. I know your, your Facebook. It used to be Saul, right? You used to be uh, someone uh, that was like the Osama bin Laden of the early church. No one would invite you to a prayer meeting, and for good reason. You'd have them arrested. You, Mr. Persecutor, you're going to get the crown of righteousness? Really? Yes. Not because of anything that Paul did, but because of his faith in what Jesus did on the cross for all of his sin, every single bit of it. Jesus paid for it on the cross, and Paul, just in humility, received that and surrendered his life to be a follower of Jesus. It's that easy. But what about for the rest of us? The rest of the verse says, goes on to say, and not only to me to receive the crown of righteousness, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Now, that's interesting. That's a hard thing, isn't it? So let me give you a quick hypothetical. Let's say that we know for a fact that Jesus is coming back tomorrow at 1.30. The rapture is going to happen. Now, no one knows the day and the hour. I get that. This is just hypothetical. What would you be thinking and feeling right now if it was very clear he's coming back tomorrow at 1.30? What would it be? Would it be, awesome, cancel a trip to Disneyland, call your Aunt Myrtle, I don't know if she knows Jesus, uh, our neighbor over here needs the gospel, or would it be, oh shoot, I've got a big business deal going in at 2.30, or even worse, oh shoot, I don't think he's going to take me, because people don't know this, but I've got this dark past, I have this closet of shame, and just so you know, we all have closets of shame, okay, all of us do. But you say that this is so shameful. How could God ever forgive me for this? Because it's so disgraceful, so shameful, I can't even forgive myself. You know what we're really doing when we say that? It's like walking up to Jesus on the cross, and there he is on the cross, dying in pain and agony with a crown of thorns, nailed to the cross for, to bear our sins, our spiritual death penalty on the cross, because the wages of sin is death. He's doing that, and we walk up to him, and we say, nice try, Jesus, but you see, for me, that's just not good enough. And I believe he responded to that lie very well when he said, it is finished. And all we have to do in humility is surrender and receive what he did on the cross for our sins, and to surrender our lives to him, to become a follower of Jesus. And he will separate that sin and that shame as far as the east is from the west. 
He will, our names will be written in the Lamb's book of life. We will become a child of the living God. And he pledges to never leave us or forsake us. That is what is there right now for those who choose to receive Christ. Not religion, but to surrender their lives to Jesus completely. Now, when I just shared that, I know some of you out there are thinking to yourselves, wow, that just hit me. I just felt something hit me in the heart. (laughs) That wasn't me. That's probably the Lord. That's probably the Holy Spirit tugging on your heart, saying, now is the time. Now is the time. Receive it. It's there. Receive it. And you can do that right now.